Thank you. See you after the show, yeah? See you all at the end. Just follow up. Good evening. Good evening. UBC. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Tepe. I was here. Good evening. See you at the end. I just want to say thank you for all of you that are here this evening. Um, still here after dinner. So it's uh, really, really uh, uh, honor for me to be able to speak this evening. It's something that uh, I know when I started, it was not my ambition. I think teachers are crazy because <laughs> it's something that uh, uh, as a youth, it's uh, that same old question that comes up, what are you going to be when you grow up? And my great uncle used to ask me that, my, my father's uncle. And I would say, well, I think I want to be a mechanic. I like cars. He said, no, 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 you should be a teacher, a lawyer, or a doctor. And at that time, I said, how am I going to be any one of those? We're not allowed to be any of those. Chinese are not allowed to be professionals, and Indians don't get the education. So my background is my father is Chinese, and my mother is from Musqueam. And both of those ethnic groups were not allowed into the professions at that time. So it's uh, really, really something to argue with my great uncle about being something that he wanted me, that I should search for and try and achieve, but it was something that was not allowed for us. And he said, well, if you want to be a doctor, you can go to California. I said, well, who wants to go to California? You know? You know how far away that is? And that's in America. So that, uh, I don't want to go there. Uh, and that's when I'm a, a boy in the 1940s. So it's uh, something that I just, it was really a challenge for me. And as I grew older, going to school, watching the teenagers in the classroom, in high school, that really made me believe that teachers are crazy. Because they, they're trying to teach the youth something that the youth already knows more about. Uh, if you ask the youth, they'll tell you, I know all about that. I heard about it already. Don't talk to me. No. And uh, that to me is, why would I want to be a teacher? Well, we grew up listening to our mom. We understood Hunkaminam, and we understood Cantonese at that time. I, I haven't retained much Cantonese, but as a youth, not going to Indian residential school, we spent time in the winter time in the big house the winter ceremonies were happening there. And that uh, gave us a real, real broad view of language and how it's used in its different forms because it's very much like what we're, ha what we're doing this evening. We're eating first and then we're doing the work. And that's normal. Uh, but during the course of conversation, during the meals, people were talking back and forth, joking, kidding around, uh, doing everything that Leanne Hinton was saying that linguists don't want the jargon, they don't want the slang, they don't care about conversation, they just want to know the rules of language. So uh, none of that is recorded, but we have a challenge there too because our, we, we, we don't know how to kid around in our language. And that, that's something that's important. 
Well, growing up that way, half Chinese and half Musqueam, our parents, my, uh, more specific, my, my father, would argue with my mother about why are you talking to them in Hunkamenum? They are learning more and more Hunkamenum and not enough Cantonese. Well, my mother doesn't speak Cantonese. And our dad, because of the Indian Act, never really lived with us. Uh, we would be down on the reserve and as a non non-Indian, uh, as, as the term is used, he wasn't allowed to live in the same house as my mother. And uh, we grew up uh, partly in Chinatown, partly in Musqueam, because we started to go to school in town and ended up having to be in town to go to school. So by the time I was about 10, I decided, well, dad's having these arguments with mom and we were not really t speaking Hunkaminum fully. Uh, we were answering in English. Our granny spoke Hunkaminum, very, very little English. He understood some English. So we would converse back and forth in two different languages. And at that time, decided I'm not going to speak either language. I'm just going to speak English and be just be a normal Canadian kid monolingual and forget about all of the languages that are around us. And just the other night I was in Chinatown uh, there's a celebration that happened in Chinatown and I'm sitting with a group of old men, uh, first generation Canadian that can't speak Cantonese either. They just don't speak Cantonese. They, they, never bought, they were never asked to learn, never forced to learn. So at this advanced age, they regret not speaking their mother tongue. And I uh, have the same feelings about letting go of two languages. Well, I finished high school, graduated high school, became a machinist as uh, Fiona mentioned. Uh, automotive machinist and I worked from 1955 until 1999 um, not really ever being without a job I was actually out of a job for five days in those 44 years so I began to talk about retiring uh, around 1996, 1997, and I mentioned to my brother, I'm going to retire in 1999. I'm going to get out of the waterfront. Uh, so many of my peers were dying from sicknesses and accidents. Said, I'm leaving early. I'm going to enjoy four or five years of my pension before I pass on. And he says, well, what are you going to do? You've been working your whole life, seven days a week most of the time. Uh, what will you be doing? I said, brother, you're the band manager. You went to college. You did all of this. You you always worked in administration. You, you write all kinds of reports. Yeah, you deal with the government and you still don't understand English. The, I am going to retire in 1999 and I'm going to do 
nothing. I'm going to go out and cut the lawn and plant some flowers for my wife and uh, just fiddle around the house and maybe pick up an uh, odd job here and there in, in the, uh, repairing somebody's car or something. Uh, I'll be fine. Um, I said, well, you know, there's a language program that's being introduced at UBC and you should really go there. Um, and you mean, and I said, you mean that, that language program that we talked about, uh, began talking in 1996, 1997. Uh, you mean that one? He says, yeah. I said, well, you know how old I am. What do you think I'm going to do with language at this age? What am I going to do as an old man trying to relearn our language? And nobody uses it. It's still the same argument as a kid. You know? Nobody uses it anyway, so we don't need to use it. Uh, it's not of any value, not of any monetary value. So we don't use it. Well, he says, no, bro, you got to do something because you're going to die in a year if you don't because you've been working so hard all your life, so regularly. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, he ch chased me for a couple of years. And finally, I signed up in 1998 for that class. And uh, there I was in this class, uh, trying to learn Hunt Kaminum. Uh, in a way that I could use it. And it's our, our, one of our instructors, Dr. Shaw, uh, and I was on council at the time when this white lady popped in the band office at the council chambers did her presentation about we're going to introduce Hunt Kaminum. We want to introduce Hunt Kaminum as a language at UBC and we need to have council acceptance of it and uh, we can move with it. And I'm going, yeah, okay, you know, what's this white lady going to do with this, with this language, you know? Uh, talking with my brother and uh, said, well, yeah, okay. And I forgot after a couple of years that I was a signatory to all of this, where this white lady is Dr. Shaw. And uh, she and the band manager and uh, the uh, UBC uh, liaison person help to develop the protocol arrangement that, that we have between UBC and Musqueam so that, that the research material comes back to us and that we own the language. Uh, and it's an agreement between Musqueam and UBC, which no, I don't think any other university has or any other community has. But it was... Uh, just my thought at the time was, yeah, I'll sign it. You know, I'm on, I'm on council anyhow. I'll just sign it. Uh, it. We'll see how long before it goes. How long before it just fails, you know? And uh, and went into the class, got my student number, was able to take other classes, took a, a couple of three or four linguistic classes and really got into trying to learn our language. And while we were in that class, 1998, there were 42 students, I believe, at that time in that classroom of September, the first week of September. 
I walked in the elder center at that time at Musqueam. 42 people. Majority of them of uh, Musqueam descent. Some from Squamish, some that lived their lives in Penelachit, and the rest were from the Musqueam community. And said, yeah, oh, okay, in a year or so we'll be all talking because all these guys are here and it's gonna be good, it's gonna be fun. And it, got, it was fun because uh, uh, one of our classmates was Fiona and she's one of the young UBC kids that came out and going to delve into uh, a foreign language and uh, sat there with a whole bunch of other 18-year-olds. It was real neat. And what I found with our, our, our language, uh, how fragmented our knowledge was of our language, our dialect of the language that I think is Hunkamenum, but most of the linguists call it Halkamelum. I don't know why, because it's an upriver dialect that they call it. So, uh, but, and we know that the dialect, there's three major dialects, the downriver, upriver, and Vancouver Island. So that uh, they're very, the same language, three dialectal differences. Uh, upriver, all the ends disappear and become L's. Our, our community is Oh, the upriver also lose all their glottalization, or 99.9% .9 of the glottalization. And downriver, we have ends with glottalization, uh, a medium amount of glottalization. Vancouver Island has a major proportion of glottalization, and they have an LN alternation where we would have two N's, sometimes they would have an L-N. And uh, so, but they're mutually intelligible. It's a language that I know that uh, our mother and our auntie from Chimenez Bay could sit for two weeks at a time in the house at the kitchen table, talking two dialects back and forth continuously for two weeks telling history over and over and over, genealogy over and over and over and over again. And uh, that's something that uh, I thought was, that's normal. Then somebody would come down uh, and speak Halkamelam with the, the, end, uh, the L dialects, and they would understand them. Uh, but it's, uh, today we, 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 we have trouble understanding our own language, our own dialect, never mind the other two. And that's, uh, and a lot of our people understood the Squamish language too. So that uh, all of those languages were spoken in, in the big house. And sometimes uh, Lummi Chasen, the Lummi people would be up, Nooksack people, Swindamish, they would be up. And we would hear those dialects, the different languages in the big house, because people would stand up and speak in their own language, in their own dialect. And the majority of the old people at that time would understand it. And that group that I was in in 1998 had no knowledge of all of this. The majority of them were residential school kids who didn't experience anything like that. And around 1970, the public speakers at Musqueam passed away. The majority, they all passed away. 
And the, and the last one was my auntie's husband, who, who code switched. Because when he got married, his wife was from Vancouver Island. And living with her, the, the many years that he did live with her, before, he, before she passed away, uh, began to code switch back and forth in the two dialects. Because uh, it's quite a thing to, to listen to it happen. Uh, where, where spouses will uh, learn that she's the boss <laughs> and she's going to speak the way she wants to, not the way you want her to. And that uh, you begin to code switch. So our auntie's husband became the main speaker at Musqueam and both my auntie and my mother, would, we'd be sitting there listening to uncle, talking on the floor. And they'd say, God, I wish you'd only speak one dialect, huh? not the two languages, because you gotta, your mind has to flip-flop all the time. And most of the people in the room at that time would be beginning to lose the knowledge of both dialects. Uh, and they end up with uh, fragmented information. So that's, uh, that was my experience about uh, how things change like that. And then uncle passed away and two other uncles came along. And both these uncles are, they, uh, we call everybody uncle, that's the, the, the I'm, I, I'm going to digress here a bit. We call, in our genealogical terminology, kinship terminology, it's all generational, that all the people that are your parents, peers, age group, they're all your uncles and aunties. Uh, but you have to know your genealogy so you can differentiate if it's uh, uncle by respect, or uncle by blood, or uncle by marriage. And you have to know all that. Uh, but these two guys, both their wives are from Vancouver Island, from Salinas Bay area, and spoke Hulk Aminum, and, and not Hunt Aminum. And they became the leaders, the speakers, the lead speakers. So it was very challenging for them to revert back to Hunt Kaminum at Musqueam in the big house. So they spoke Hulk Kaminum and their wives spoke Hulk Kaminum. The, the wives when they had children, passed on the whole communion of knowledge to their children and grandchildren. So their experience was, we have a language that's an official language of the big house and ceremony, and that's whole communion. And I'm going, um, we're the warriors of the Fraser River, uh, we are the people that defended this territory for thousands of years. I'm going to speak someone else's dialect in my house. Give your head a shake. You know, we don't do those things. Uh, we speak our own dialect in our house. And if you don't understand it, you get someone else to translate it for you. I don't have to do that on the floor in my house. You have to acquiesce to me, unless you're my wife. So. <laughs> and that's uh, something that's uh, really, really true. So in 1998, I'm gonna go back there now, that gift, we had 
all of those uh, perceptions of language, language hierarchy, and why we use certain languages in the room. And we had those arguments, very, very heated uh, dialogue, is it? And uh, made the instructors cry at times, because uh, uh, the whole class would just break apart the, and gather around the debate. But the instructors would be just going. Uh, and, and it was a perception of the different groups in the room, the different, uh, uh, there are different perceptions of language and why we use a certain uh, a speaker. Because when our speakers died, our old people would hire somebody from Vancouver Island that still had speakers on the floor so that things would be carried out in a traditional manner and not in English as it is today. So our communities uh, and upriver, uh, the two dialects that carry on ceremony in English. And uh, we had those differences in class. So from 42 people, 42 registered students, I think the class dropped down to about 15. I think, it, I, I, I can't even remember the numbers, but it just, phew, uh, everybody bailed out because the majority of them were Musqueam. And they, they thought we were really going to uh, get physical. Uh, and, but we, we talked over and over and over again uh, about why the island dialect was used on the floor and how come we never had a Muslim speaker. And my reply was, was always, because you guys didn't want to step up, I let it, I let it go just like you. I, I can't stand up there and speak. I've never been trained to be a speaker. That's, uh, that's our kid brother. Our baby brother is our family speaker. Always has been since he's about 15 years old. But he doesn't speak Hunt Camino, speaks English. But we ended up uh, destroying that class but the 15 moved on into second year, and uh, then we moved on into third year, and then fourth year. So that's uh, really, really something for me to be able to stand here. My first public speaking in Hunt Kaminum was right here. Um, my, my young brother, who now is the executive director of the First Nations Summit, um, he said, you're taking, you're doing the language, right? And I heard you, you can do an introduction. I said, yeah. Why don't you go, the uh, Aboriginal grad is happening at UBC, you know? You're a UBC student, you know? So, uh, why don't you go and uh, do the welcome for the graduating class? And I go, oh, I've never done public speaking, never. The only public speaking I've done uh, up to that time was talking in class, talking to the students and uh, doing short little phrases and things. And what was on my mind in 1998 was to, I just want to learn how to say thank you to everyone that's here. Uh, it's good to see you here. I'm happy you've gathered here on the traditional lands of Musqueam to do the work you're doing. So that's all I wanted to learn. So, uh, 
ended up coming here. He wrote some English stuff for me. And he says, you got to do the intro in Hun Camino. Yeah, OK. I got here, come through the door. And I'm looking and looking. Who is right in front here? Auntie Irene, the lady that always spoke with our mom. And I said, holy cow. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I already promised that I was gonna do it in Hun Camino, so I gotta do it, and uh, ended up doing it. And how emotional that is! From the time I I did it in class at our potluck final dinners to say thank you to everyone for about four or five years. I could hear my granny talking. I could hear our grannies, uh, our married grannies talking to me. Their voices were coming at me, just coming, 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 while I, while I was trying to learn. So. For about four or five years, every time I opened up my mouth, I would cry. Tears would just come. Because I could hear all of that happening, where our granny would be admonishing us or, 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 or praising us or telling us to come here or telling us to go there and do whatever. And could hear people talking could hear the memory was coming out about language, about our ancestors. And it was at that time that I, my mind that said, what the hell am I going to do with language at 62? Was, wow. My peers in the classroom didn't know the value of identi identification, <clears throat> didn't know the value of dialectal difference, and how much cultural content is embedded in language. And that is what kept coming out while I was doing all these talks and, and carrying on into third and fourth year of Hunt Kaminam, the importance of language to who you are, importance to self, importance to your kinship, and the importance to your community, and the importance of where you belong is all tied up in your dialect of your language. And that was coming out. And I know our mom used to always talk about that. This knowledge that I am trying to impart to you is your anchor to who you are. This is your anchor. She never used the words of, this is, these are your roots. This is who you are. This is who you belong to. This is what you belong to. And this is how you belong to it. It's in the language. And my mother, our mother, she was the encyclopedia of our community, of our family. And I could not get her to go on tape. I will not come back to you after I am dead. 
If you don't listen to me now, everything I go to the grave with will be gone. You want to learn language? You come and sit in the kitchen and start talking. And she, like many other elders that we knew, they may not be that way in your communities, but I can remember about 10 years ago asking someone, tell me how to pray. Tell me how to pray, how you do that. You, you do this, this Roman Catholic thing. How many times you heard me? How many times you heard me? You don't listen. Huh. You don't listen. No. She rattled it off. Bang, 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 bang. There. There you go. So, because it's something uh, in our, in our, the way our culture was taught to us, it's something that we don't pray in a gathering. There are no prayers in a gathering. Our prayers are personal. I wake up in the morning and I say, thank you for letting me wake up. Thank you for letting me be healthy. And thank you helping me look after my family and doing the right things. Thank you. That's it. Um, there's no, and if I'm going hunting, I prepare myself, get my mind in the right space, and talk to the animal that you're going after. Please show yourself so I can take your life so that I can feed my family. Let me kill you. Let me take your life. And when you do, you say thank you. Thank you for letting me take your life. Thank you for showing yourself to me and coming to me. And that's the grace. That's the grace. So when I sit down to eat, I presume that the rancher has said thank you to the cow that he killed to sell on the market. I don't do grace. As a boy, coming home from Sunday at the catechism house, not even at the catechism house, at the church, the back of the church. Learning about Roman Catholic stuff. Ask my mom, how come my papa doesn't say grace? The only time I see him saying, or somebody say grace, is when they're feeding the priest that's starving and comes here to eat. Uh, that's when she told me that. Somebody has already said thank you to the animals, to the birds, to the fish, to the trees. They say thank you to the trees for giving me the bark to fi fix my things. Thank you for giving me the wood. Thank you. And that, uh, that's how I learned that stuff. So when people think I'm ungrateful for not saying grace, I'm not. When I don't stand up in the big house or in this gathering, it's not out of disrespect. No one was allowed to stand in the big house when they were doing ceremony, when they were doing the talking, because they would be talking at the same level that you're at. 
And if the six foot person in front of you stands up, you can't see what's going on. You can hear the words, but you can't tell if those things are happening. So everybody stays down, so everybody can see it. And all of this is tied into the cultural things that happen, our language, and the value of language. And I'm really, really happy that we're learning the way we are. Because to me, without the linguistic analysis, without working with a community linguist, we wouldn't be able to do it. Our community, we have, we have no speakers. 2002, the last first language speaker passed away. So we work from archives and recordings, transcriptions, old stories that have been recorded. And then when somebody asks us to interpret, we're looking at all the, diff uh, all the three dialects, looking through all of those archived materials to come up with the concept of interpretation. But it's something that, uh, something that I think it's uh, really, really hard to, to work through because I know uh, the non-indigenous student doesn't carry the baggage that we carry from the Indian residential school. The uh, many, many things that come out is really, really, you, you can see it happening. Standing in front of the class, you can see all of that. You don't have to know anything. It's just boom, 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 boom. Students from China, Japan, Germany, France, Australia, New Zealand, no problem. Indigenous students from North America have this unconscious lock, this unconscious brick wall in front of them, myself included. I didn't go to Indian residential school. But I grew up knowing that our language was not spoken. And that's something to watch. Non-indigenous students come forward and speak and, and move with our languages. And our community doesn't realize it or won't admit it. We have an unconscious block that's in there, passed down from how many generations now, that our language is not to be spoken, it's forbidden, it's something that we don't use. And not knowing that if we learn our language, we don't have to speak it, we need to learn it. If you can learn your language and find out everything that's embedded in it, the cultural meanings, the cultural belonging, the cultural ceremonies, your identity and how you are connected to one another on this land, then you can have a better life. And that's the anchor that our mother talked about. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what other people think of you and say what they think of you, you know your anchor. And this is what it is that's going to keep you going through life. That is not important how that other person calls you, chinky chinky Chinaman or some dirty, stinky Indian. It's not important. You are half Chinese and you are Indian. But they don't know what they're talking about. They themselves may have that 
fear of knowing who they are themselves. And this is why they call you down. But you come from this, uh, this family of Kepalana, you come from Musgrim, you come from the secret societies, and this is what's going to carry you. So that's uh, really a, an important factor for all of us to pass on. How much of this can help you in the social issues that become the determinants of life. Your self-identity, your self-worth, your community, your ceremonies, everything is tied into that. Because we're all sitting here wearing blue jeans, wearing artificial material, wearing shoes, clashing, uh, I don't want to talk about underwear, <laughs> but here we are, and we're all speaking and understanding English. So what makes us indigenous? Department of Indian Affairs number? Department of Indian Affairs designation? And that's not it, it's language. Language is the only thing that identifies you. And I got to appreciate hearing someone say, if that person's speaking with an accent, that person knows another language. So he's speaking to you in your language, but also knows another language. So that, that's a really important thing to understand. You know, that though all those different accents meant that you had roots in another language. And I'm not making fun now. When we were kids, we could tell from the English accents which community they pretty well came from. And they were people learning English from their grandparents' uh, accent. Their, their dialect was coming out. Uh, I was a teenager, and my first cousin said, I'm going fishing. I'm going to be a cook on a seine boat from Alert Bay. Well, I'm going to be out there cooking with those guys? Yeah, I got asked to be the cook. So when, when C came home, C was talking like C came from Alert Bay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not making fun. Yeah. But you knew right away where she came from. Uh, when she spoke English like that. And, and it only took one summer for her to go roll into that accent. Uh, and she came home talking like that. Uh, and we said, holy cow, you're from Alert Bay. <laughs> uh, uh, and she what do you mean? I don't talk like them. I said, yes, you do. And, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a real important thing. See, with me, it was something that uh, before I got into language, it was, yeah, uh, they can't get their tongue around language, so they talk in this way. But I also thought so much that it was a sociological fear of loss of identity. It's like a room full of Scotsmen or a room full of Englishmen. And they can tell you what city you come from, what neighborhood you come from, and which corner of the intersection you come from. And that's, uh, that's how valuable English, or, or that, not English, but that's how valuable language is to who we are as a people. And 
I know I worked uh, on the waterfront. Uh, the electrical department was really neat because an Englishman, a Scotsman, a Geordie, an Australian, a New Zealander, and a Canadian. And they all had their own dialect of English. And it was real neat. You could, you could tell who was talking right away. You didn't have to recognize their voice, it's just the accent. So that's really, really what we need. The Indian Residential School was erasing all of that denying all of our language, denying the worth, denying the worth of our people, our culture, our language, our ceremony, and it's all tied to language. So the first thing to do is destroy language, and then you have no way of communicating. You come home from Indian residential school, you can't talk to your grandma, so you're lost. And Social, psychological research shows that. When you lose all of that, you become an addict of something. You might work seven days a week. You might gamble seven days a week. You might be addicted to sex, gambling, drugs and alcohol, or commit suicide because you don't belong to anything. So that's all tied to language. And this is what I found. And I'm happy, I'm where I'm at. Not quite. Uh, I just need to work harder. Uh, but I'm getting lazier and lazier as I get older uh, to actually become fluent in our language. And, and I hope the generations coming up do their best to regain their identity so that we can have a more healthy communities and mindset about ourselves to the point where we can actually say, I love myself. I don't need to do all of this. So that, uh, but if I don't stop now, I, uh, I'll talk till midnight. Um, I think I inherited some of my mother's ways. I uh, uh, would ask her a question, and she'd say, sit down, have some tea, have some soup, and go and talk to you. Go and talk to you. And she'd tell me story after story after story. I said, I want to ask the question. He didn't give me the answer. I said, you're not listening. You will hear the answer if you were listening to my stories. And the answers are in the stories. And in that way, she, by using that method, she didn't just uh, give you the information. You had to analyze the story. And you had to listen to it. And that is part of our cultural heritage. So it's uh, something that I hope one day I can stop talking like this. <laughs> but not, not, not the final solution, though. It, uh, it just, uh, I like my young brother, he can give you answers. Boom, 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 boom. And in the story. But it's, uh, the reason why our mom used to do that, she used to say, it's like getting a whipping when we're kids. They used to go, uh, corporal punishment was normal. Uh, get a whipping. Go, get, go out there and get that branch out there and I'm going to whip you. Uh, so, and it was not a whipping. The whipping you could handle. You know, it was a whack, 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 whack for five minutes or something. But it was an hour and a half of talking that come at you. Now these are the reasons why you are being punished. And if you didn't do this, that wouldn't happen. If you didn't do that, that wouldn't happen. And so you have to understand, the corporal punishment was because all of these things that you did not believe in, that it was going to happen. And uh, 
other aunties, they would just punish their kids and say, that's it, go on. You know? And they wouldn't understand what they got punished for. Just, you did something, you're going to get beat. So, anyways, uh, any questions or comments or uh, uh, commands to get off the stage? <laughs> Uh. Um, I just had a question when you were talking about uh, pushing through like the wall, the blocks you felt. I was just wondering if you had any breakthroughs and what personally worked for you, because that like really spoke to me with my language learning. Uh, <clears throat> the wall that I, I speak of, I don't think I've broken through that yet. Um, and the only thing that I find that works for me is get out of your comfort zone. Believe in what you want in the language. Believe that you can do it. Believe that it's worth something. And that is the only thing I can say. If you don't have that belief, it's not going to work you know, to, to move beyond. Other people using language, it's a language. But we have all those cultural baggage to work through. That it's just real. Every person has a different wall. And you have to try and figure that out. It's like being a drunk, an alcoholic. Uh, you get tired and you, and you wonder, why am I getting drunk, you know? I wish I could stop. And until you really talk to yourself about what bothers you the most, and you have to talk with someone. With me, it was my mother, talking with my mom, talk with my mom, talk with my mom then you can stop. You, you can move that wall aside and, and move forward. But until you do that, it, 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 you, you won't know what, what, what actually is your wall. Uh, and that everybody has to work on it themselves. I um, have a little grandniece. Oh, another little story. Uh, <laughs> uh, we raised, we, we babysat her since she was born, like, and, uh, and you know how girls are when they start to bring this guy around. Uh, she's a young teenager. She says, Auntie, Auntie, I gotta talk to you. And she brings her boyfriend in. And while she's going down the hall to the bedroom to talk to Auntie, she says, and you, don't you talk to Papa. Don't you ask him even about a butterfly. He says, because we don't have time. I'm asking Auntie something I'm going. <laughs> so, so that, it's just, uh, that's why I say I have to stop. 